Hey guys, <clears throat> hear me? Hello. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thanks. All right. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, just a little note about the uh, pharmacology exam. We will have. Uh, it's actually uh, four chapters. The second, the other two chapters are very small. You know, the charts are just a couple pages. That's it each. So we should be fine for Wednesday. I, I should be able to finish them. Uh, so it'll be it'll be four chapters, but again, the anti-protozoal uh, and anti-helminth are uh, and anti-parasitic are very small. They're not that much, so uh, you know I'll I'll cover it on Wednesday, so we should be fine. All right, let's go ahead and continue. Uh, <clears throat> so we're talking cardiovascular. We talked about the uh, congestive heart failure. We, we talked about different uh, types of heart failure in general and some of the risk factors and the causes and uh, ideology, uh, clinical manifestations, some of the therapeutic treatment and all that that uh, would be covered. So now we're gonna go into the acute myocardial infarction. So uh, it's uh, referred to as MI, and uh, we call that a heart attack also. So many times we refer to this as a heart attack. Um, and um, uh, with this, we know all about it uh, in general. Uh, we covered this a bunch of times before, but uh, the issue with this is uh, are the, uh, the coronary arteries. Uh, in this case, the coronary arteries are the ones that supplies the muscle of the heart with oxygen. And uh, if you have any issues with the coronary arteries, any type of uh, obstruction or uh, vasospasm or any issues that you would have in the uh, with the coronary arteries, you're going to end up having a blockage, and then uh, from there, you could end up having what we call a myocardial infarction. So an infarction is a necrosis, again, of the, uh, my, uh, of the uh, heart muscles, specifically the, um, uh, the, uh, the middle layer, okay, uh, myocardium. So the myocardium is affected in general. Um, the uh, this is a nice picture here of uh, the uh, the black area here shows you the um, the necrosis necrotic area or the infarct in this uh, ventricle here left ventricle usually that's where you have um, the majority of the issue and when you have it uh, at the left ventricle then it's going to affect the pumping and the contraction of this muscle of course. So uh, usually a uh, patient, uh, you know, this picture shows you how they have tightness of chest, tightness or pain in the chest. That is one significant sign of getting into an acute myocardial infarction. Now they called it acute uh, because usually it happens uh, suddenly, you know, you get uh, an acute heart attack. Uh, it happens all of a sudden. Uh, you feel the pain, the chest pain all of a sudden. Uh, and um, it can actually, uh, uh, you can, you know, it can kill you or you can come out of it. But because of the uh, sudden uh, onset of this myocardial infarction, that's where we go with acute. Now, here are some of the uh, pathophysiology if we talk about these myocardial infarctions. Um, it's irreversible. So the damage of the, <clears throat> of, that is caused on the myocardium or the uh, heart muscle in general, the different layers of the heart muscles, uh, it's irreversible. When you go into an infarct, you, you, you have this forever. Uh, you have a damage. Now, you, you can, you're going to end up having a scar on the heart. So you're going to see a scar uh, on the area where it, uh, it died. And uh, the whole thing is, as we know, it's due to what we call ischemia. And the term ischemia is the, the reduction of uh, oxygen. So when we say hypoxia uh, is the, the low amount of oxygen reaching to that muscle, uh, and that's referred to as ischemia. So, uh, so when you have uh, uh, ischemia, then you can end up having an occlusion at the end. And if any occlusion, uh, many times it's caused by uh, a plaque, a uh, rupture of a plaque that comes out of the wall, the internal wall, and then you have platelets, uh, uh, you know, coagulating right here, and then eventually having a thrombus probably right there in the lumen of the coronary arteries. 
So this is just a, a, a graph here or a table that comes in and uh, shows you how atherosclerosis, okay, which is a plaque inside the lumen of the cornea artery, can lead to obstruction gradually. And then uh, it show, and then eventually you have ischemia coming out of that. So uh, this is the British uh, spelling of ischemia. You know, we don't put the A here, but you can, uh, you know, uh, this is just the British uh, spelling. So uh, we can have an arterial, uh, arterial spasm. So coronary spasm, just narrowing of the coronary arteries, can lead also to an obstruction. Uh, an obstruction is just narrowing or blockage of the, of the path. So uh, severe spasm can lead to blockage also. Uh, eventually it leads to ischemia, hypoxia, reduced oxygen demand, you know, because you, um, you know, the, the uh, when you have uh, less oxygen reaching the tissue, eventually you can have what we call angina, which is uh, basically the uh, uh, symptoms that you get, which is a chest pain. Uh, a thrombus, if you build a thrombus uh, where you have the narrowing is, you can uh, get uh, the, you know, the unstable angina, and that's the one that, uh, uh, basically, you're sitting down and doing nothing, and eventually you get that chest pain. Uh, usually, when unstable angina is related to a thrombus or a blockage, uh, coronary blockage, uh, you know that's what uh, majority of the causes. Uh, you end up having a permanent thrombus, and then eventually necrosis, which is you know called myocardial infarction. So some of the risk factors here. Uh, you know, uh, men ages 45 and older and women age 55 and older um, are at risk. So uh, tobacco would be one of the uh, major uh, triggers, maybe uh, high blood pressure, uh, high cholesterol, uh, high level of triglycerides, obesity, diabetes, and metabolic syndrome, which includes usually uh, high blood pressure and cholesterol and other issues uh, with the um, with the aldosterone, uh, the kidney, uh, family history of heart attacks. Also, all these are risk factors dramatically. So, if you fit in any of these categories, there is a chance of you getting a heart attack. So what are some of the clinical manifestations that we can see? Uh, pressure or tightness of the chest. Usually they grab on the chest and they feel like uh, there's a brick you know, uh, pushing against their chest. Uh, they have difficulty in breathing. Uh, the pain usually shoots up their jaw sometimes. So it shoots up to the, you know, more, most likely on the left side than the right side, but it could happen on either side. So the left side, you'll have uh, pain shooting from the chest up their neck into their jaw. Uh, sometimes it shoots back into the back also. So back pain, front, upper jaw, uh, the arm, you know, it goes down to the arm, uh, the left arm sometimes, patients grabs on their arm, that would be another sign. Uh, so shortness of breath, sweating, sweating, they'll, be, they'll have a hydrosis, uh, they sweat, they usually untie their necktie if they have one, because they, they have difficulty in breathing. They get nauseated, you know, so many, this is one typical sign of possibly heart attack. You start with a little nausea. People think that they are having an acid reflux, but it's actually, it could be due to that. Uh, some some will, get, will vomit. Uh, more nausea than vom vomiting, very few that vomits, but in general, more nausea than vomiting. Uh, people become very irritable and anxious. You know, they, they don't know what to do. They will be just... Uh, uh, you know, uh, walking around and very nervous. Uh, some coughs, you know, they cough. So any of these symptoms, if you get any of that, then uh, that could be a sign of possible, well, possible heart attack. So what are some of the statistics and prognosis of a myocardial infarction? Uh, it depends on the location of the MI. So if it's uh, very soon, we're going to look at uh, different changes in the EKG, if it's located uh, in the anterior wall of the heart, inferior wall of the heart, or the lateral wall of the heart. So it depends on the location, that's how you can get uh, the different types of MIs. So 25% of the patient dies from uh, the initial event. There are 
percent, they just collapse right there and they die. So, uh, and some, uh, you know, die either on the spot or just on their way to the hospital, you know, so, uh, or within the first day. So that's acute, very dangerous. Uh, you know, you can die from this within uh, moments. 25% uh, will die within the next two years. So if you get one heart, you know, it depends on how many coronary arteries have you um, uh, clogged. If you, the more arteries you clog, the higher chance of you actually dying from this uh, problem. So 68.4% males and 89.8% females still living uh, have already lived 10 to 14 years. So 68% uh, they survive 10 to 14 years. Uh, the chance of you getting another uh, blockage is high, you know, so there's a, so if you don't change your uh, lifestyle, uh, eating style, you know, you don't exercise and so on, eventually you can get a, another one. So, so usually uh, they can, uh, uh, you know, get another uh, heart attack from a different uh, coronary artery. The younger you are, the better prognosis. That's how you look at it. So if you are younger and you get that uh, heart attack, the better chance of you living uh, within those 10 to 14 years rather than uh, dying. So complications would be, uh, you know, ischemia, of course, you know, ischemia of the tissue. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course, the heart will uh, uh, sometimes fail to pump, so you will have less oxygen going out to the, to the uh, brain and uh, to everywhere else. Uh, angina, reinfarction, so you can actually reinfarct the same area. So you have uh, already an infarct, you have dead tissue, now your, your heart, your body normally will start uh, uh, creating new uh, new, new capillaries to supply or go around that infarct and go into the good area, but some of that blood supply will go into the infarct area, and then one of these uh, coronary arteries will be blocked also again. So you, um, you know, you can have uh, like an extension uh, to that old infarct by infarcting a new area. So mechanically, you can have a heart failure out of that. You can have a cardiogenic shock uh, from a my myocardial infarction. Uh, one of the valves, uh, you know, could uh, mal start malfunctioning, or a malfunction uh, can can cause this. Either way, uh, you could be you could have an aneurysm. You know, an aneurysm could be, uh, you know, a, a, one of the reasons that uh, you know you can have uh, due to the pooling of blood within the arteries. Uh, cardiac rupture, you can, uh, you can rupture, uh, you can rupture a, a, uh, uh, the heart muscle. You can perforate all the way to the inside of the ventricles. So this necrotic tissue or the, the infarct can go in different layers. You know, you can start from the outside and it'll start digging deeper and deeper and then you can end up uh, going through the whole three layers uh, of the heart and then you'll have a uh, bleeding coming, uh, you know, you have blood coming out of that, that uh, ventricle. So uh, an aneurysm also in the coronary arteries. You can have an aneurysm of the coronary arteries because of the blockage. The backflow of blood can lead to ballooning of the artery and then eventually having an aneurysm there. So um, arrhythmia, you can have abnormal uh, arrhythmias because of the heart attacks. So uh, atrial or ventricular arrhythmias, you know, sinus or atrioventricular. So uh, it depends on the type of ventricle. So you have ventricular arrhythmias and that's one of the main, most dangerous, you know, uh, ventricles, that, I mean, arrhythmias that you don't want. So in, within the past 24 hours, Uh, of sustaining MI, you, you can end up having ventricular fibrillation, right? And we said fibrillation is like uh, when your heart go crazy and start beating more than 200, 250 beats per minute. So the ejection fraction is gonna be very, very small and the, especially the stroke volume uh, will not be there. So you pass out because of this. Many people passes out because of the ventricular fibrillation that you get. 
So uh, when you diagnose MIs, there are different ways to diagnose it, but these are the three major steps that we do. Uh, usually you look at the history and physical, you know, physical examination on patient, you can do that to assess. Then you can uh, look at the EKG findings and you can do a blood uh, workup, a cardiac profile on the patient to see the extent of the muscle damage. And usually you have those uh, enzymes that uh, rises when you have an MI. So this is a basic chart where you can look at uh, when we diagnose, uh, you know, MI. Eyes. Uh, again, uh, this is the clinical setting symptoms and all that. So you have the uh, very low pain here, and then as you uh, as you uh, get worse, eventually the pain will be will cover more and more of the body. So eventually, if it's very high, you're going to end up having CPR because your heart can stop. Now the EKG findings. We're going to look at the EKG findings very soon, uh, more in more details. But um, you know, this is a normal cycle here. Uh, you can have what we call an ST depression. So an ST segment, which is from here to here, that would be your ST segment. It will be depressed. It means coming down this way. So you, you, you will notice that this is normal. And here I have a depression in the ST segment. So in mild situations, you're going to end up having ST depression. Uh, you know, in, in severe, you're going to have a profound ST depression. That means it becomes very low. So look at the ST depression here and look at the ST depression here. This is further down. So the further down the ST depression, the worse you are. Now, you can end up having what we call an ST elevation. That is when you have what we call uh, a STEMI, uh, which is a, a certain, uh, which is down here, uh, ST elevation myocardial infarction. That's what it stands for. And usually if you have those STEMIs, we rule out MIs for sure. So when you see an, a STEMI, you know, which, which is an ST elevation on, uh, on EKG, and it's gonna be on multiple leads, we'll talk about them in a second, uh, then there's a good chance that you just have an MI. Now here, uh, you could be a likelihood of MIs, but it could be angina also. Uh, ischemia, for example, the ST depression can be, you know, you, you, can, you can rule out ischemia also with that. But uh, as we uh, progress into an MI, usually the chest pain kind of uh, increases and it covers more area than uh, initially. And you will see the changes of the depression as you are still going. But uh, when you, uh, when you uh, <clears throat> go unconscious and your heart could... Uh, uh, stopped, and uh, there's a good chance of uh, the EKG to have an SD elevation or a STEMI, we call that. So, these two here, uh, the troponin is one of the enzymes that we look at. It's a protein that you have actually in the heart, and we look at it and we look at the levels of it. Okay, the more it increases in the blood, the higher chance that you are uh, having an MI. And again, we, we said these enzymes uh, can, or hormones, you know, troponin. Uh, is uh, they, they increase in number uh, as we damage more and more muscle, muscle, uh, you know, heart muscle. So um, triage, and that's when you go in and uh, rule out MIs. Uh, so if uh, you look at the patient at the beginning and you tell them, you know, uh, where's your pain? And, uh, you know, on the scale of one to 10, how far is it? You know, here they, they'll tell you about maybe three. You know, this one, it'll be like a six. This one is like a nine, okay? And this is like a 10. You know, this is really, you know, all over and they can't, they barely can't breathe in this one here. So, uh, you know, uh, you can obser observe them here. Here, rule it out, here, observe. But here, you know, if they pass out, for sure, it could be an MI here. And down here, like I said, you know, uh, when you have these type of things, you can be, uh, you can have what we call an unstable angina, you know, so stable uh, when you are just exercising, unstable when you're sitting down and you're having that chest pain. So we can do a stress test on these patients and see how much they can take uh, the exercise and rule out uh, either angina or going to an MI. 
So these are some of the types of MIs that we can diagnose people with, uh, depending on the type and how severe uh, the blockage is right in this image here. So if you are just having a partial blockage right here uh, with the plaque, the yellow area is the, the cholesterol plaque uh, increasing, and then you have a thrombus going, then you are in MI type one. So type one is usually has to do with uh, a plaque, okay? So if you have a plaque uh, erosion, or uh, it means breaking apart, uh, and then you end up having a little bit of, uh, you know, a clotting going, then you're type one. Now type two, usually you have what we call, uh, you know, it, it, could be, it could be due to ischemia or vasospasm. So type two could be an ischemia, a vasospasm, or it could be a, uh, an absolute full blockage right there uh, in one of the coronary arteries, you know. So, um, so uh, type two that would be uh, here, infarction secondary to ischemia due to either increased oxygen demand or decreased supply. Now the third, uh, sudden unexpected cardiac death. Okay, uh, often with symptoms suggested to have an, a myocardial. Uh, now, a type four myocardial infarction uh, associated with uh, percutaneous cutaneous coronary uh, intervention, all right, or a stent. Anybody can comment on this? What is, what is this here? What is a percutaneous coronary in intervention? Or what is a stent? So it's basically, it, um, it's something that vascular surgeons like to use to maintain the integrity of, of the vessels, um, uh, uh, at least the affected vessels. Um, yes. So it's, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's a little invasive, but it's, um, you know, and it can be, it can be risky, but, you know, it, it helps, it helps improve quality of life. Yes. So if you do have a clot, basically what we do is what we call, we, we call that an angioplasty. So we do an angioplasty on it, on you, and that's referred to as percutaneous uh, coronary intervention, uh, where we put a stent inside, you know, so we take the plaque out, and we put like a, 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 like a cage in here that keeps the uh, blood vessel open, because if we don't put that uh, metallic cage, or now it's out of plastic, then this blood vessel will collapse again, and then you will end up having um, you know, uh, spasm of that, of that, uh, of that uh, artery here. So you put a cage in there to maintain the opening of that blood vessel. So blood flow will continue going. So that is referred to as percutaneous coronary intervention, which is referred to as an angioplasty. Uh, type five myocardial infarction, myocardial infarction associated with cardiac surgery. So this is the open heart type of thing. So after we do an open heart, you're gonna end up having another myocardial infarction, so you're type five. Type four, after an angioplasty. You know, uh, type three, you, we say you die right away from a cardiac arrest, then you're type three myocardial infarction. Uh, myocardial injury, uh, multifactorial uh, etiologies, acute or chronic based on changes in cardiac troponin concentration with serial testing. So you have continuous injury to the myocardium. So not one area, but multiple areas there. And we usually uh, monitor this uh, through the troponin level. So you take uh, a blood test and you check the troponin level, and you're gonna see that it's positive continuously all the time. Then you refer to that as myocardial injury type, MIs. All right, so anatomically, sometimes we look at the ventricle itself. When you look at the ventricle itself, uh, we look at the depth of the uh, necr necrosis or infarct. If it goes through all the way, this is referred to as transmural MI. So a transmural MI is when, you, when this infarct or necrosis goes through the whole, the three layers of the heart. And we said we have the epicardium, myocardium, and then the endocardium. So if you go through the three layers, then you end up having uh, with what we call transmural MI. 
If you have only the superficial part, then you call that subendocardial MI. So subendocardial MI will be just superficial. It won't go, it does not penetrate all the way. So it's partially occluded epicardial coronary arteries. That's what it is. Uh, many times when you have a transural, you're gonna end up having what we call a Q wave on the EKG, which we will discuss soon when we look at them. Uh, when you do autopsy on this, uh, usually you, uh, it's not, uh, uh, it's not a confirmative type of uh, uh, diagnosis if you do an autopsy on there. Sometimes uh, you can see it, sometimes you can't. So if we do a blood test on you, these are some of the enzymes and hormones that we look at when you are, when we are suspecting a, an MI. Uh, so we call these cardiac markers refer to them as cardiac markers. So we have creatinine kinase here with myoglobin, okay? So creatinine kinase usually is released when the muscle is damaged. Uh, myoglobin uh, usually stores oxygen in the muscle cells. So like hemoglobin, we have hemoglobin in the RBCs, we have myoglobin in our muscle cells. So these myoglobins actually stores and uh, it stores the oxygen, so that's where all the oxygen is stored in your muscle cell, uh, especially, especially the heart uh, muscle. So uh, again, creatinine kinase, uh, they're uh, released when you have muscle damage, and if you remember, uh, creatinine, creatinine comes from creatinine. Creatinine is, are the proteins that comes out when you have muscle damage, and then eventually the enzyme that changes creatine to creatinine to creatine would be creatine kinase. Now troponin is the other uh, hormone that we look at. We have troponin T and I. Uh, these are basically needed uh, for contraction. And if you are, if they're elevated, that means you're trying to, con to, to try to contract more than you should because you have an MI and that shows you that there's a chance of you, um, you know, having issues there. So these are some abnormal values here for you. Uh, I mean, abnormal values in, in general, if you have activities, uh, this is the peak and then duration. So you should have anything less than three to eight, less than eight to 12 in this case, when you have these type of, um, yeah. So troponin one levels rises in about three hours right away as soon after, after you have a heart attack, uh, within three hours, you'll have troponin uh, I going up, okay? Uh, it peaks at 14 to 18 hours and remains elevated for five to seven days. Where troponin T uh, levels, it rises in three to five hours instead of, uh, uh, you know, well, it's instead of only three hours. And then uh, it remains elevated for 10 to 14 days instead of five to seven. So if you check, uh, after 10 days, uh, uh, the blood test, you're going to see that troponin T is still there after the MI. So here are some of the curves that you can look at uh, explaining these. The only one that I'm explaining is the LDH, which is uh, lactate dehydrogenase. Okay, do not confuse lactate dehydrogenase with uh, LDL, low-density lipoprotein. This is an enzyme that is also released when you have damage to the muscles. Okay, you produce a lot of lactic dehydrogenase enzyme from lactic acid. You know that when you work out too much, you build up lactic acid in your muscles, and that is the muscle that breaks down lactic acid, basically. So when this is working very hard, then it's going to be increased, elevated. Okay, so this is, these are the hours. So within about eight hours or so, you'll have LDH going up. So you can see how they're elevated here, at different types of... Uh, hours after you have the uh, MI. I have a question really quick about that. Yes. Um, so is the chart telling us something different than the points? Because on the point you said troponin T remains elevated for 10 to 14 days, but isn't the chart saying five to 10 or is the chart saying something else? Am I just reading the chart wrong? Troponin T? Yeah, because duration of abnormality in days doesn't it say five to ten on the chart, or does that yeah. mean something different? Uh, 
you know what? Because it says uh, detectable three to eight hours on the chart, mm -hmm. but then you said three to five hours. I just don't know which one should we go with. Yeah, or so am I just I, part, am I I, part three hours. With that. No, you know what? Here, I don't want you taking this seriously more than anything else because both of them, uh, they rise later on. You do it within five to seven days, but one of them stays a little longer. That's all. You know, don't don't go with the specifics here. You know, but just get the idea of uh, I, you know, rises, you know, within three hours and it stays a little bit less. It peaks with a little bit less than the T. And that's all. So I would not worry about uh, the specifics about them, you know, more than that. So you should okay. be here again. All right, so here's, uh, you know, when, when you have an EKG, we look at the EKGs and then we want to diagnose if you have an MI or not. Two things that we look at, we look at the ST segment. So this is your ST segment. So this is a normal cycle, as you remember. You have the P wave, Q, R, S, and then uh, ST segment here, and then this is the T wave here. So we look at the ST elevation here, okay? So when you have it elevated too much, if you remember from picture before, then we know that, see, look at the ST elevation here. See how the ST is going climbing up here. So the ST elevation, along with a Q wave, you know, this is, this is what we call a Q wave right there. So this little hook coming down is the Q wave, uh, the Q uh, wave. So usually the Q is not very significant in a normal uh, cardiac cycle, okay? But in this case, if you have a, uh, an MI, usually this Q wave is very prominent. You can see it like a little dark marker type of, uh, uh, you know, so because when EKG is going, it gets stuck here a little bit and then keep going. See, it gets stuck here a little bit and it keeps going. So when it gets stuck because of the infarction, you know, because there's no pathway for it to go. So this is actually a significant sign of an MI on the EKG. We'll look at the ST elevation soon and look at the different STEMIs that we can get and, uh, you know, the QA, uh, you know, you need to understand also, uh, uh, you know, that leads to an MI if you have a significant Q wave there. So uh, when we diagnose uh, MIs also, we look at what we call STEMIs, you know, how far is the uh, is the elevation so when uh, the higher it is the the uh, more uh, of you thinking of an MI rather than ischemia because um, you know uh, and also depression you know so don't confuse a depression with a, uh, an elevation so when it goes up like this that is an elevation uh, so uh, so this is referred to as the J point by the way that's where your elevation starts of the ST uh, of the ST uh, segment. So um, J point is where the ST elevates. <clears throat> uh, this is just showing you that this is a 25 millimeters per second kind of thing, and that's where what we use. You know, uh, is a normal EKG speed, and this is the voltage, which is 10 millimeters per millivolts, and that's the normal voltage of this EKG here. Now, uh, if you have an acute coronary syndrome, which is usually what we're thinking of an MI, uh, the EKG can show an ST elevation or uh, there's no ST elevation. If there's no ST elevation, then we do a cardiac markers on you. So we do a blood test. And then if it's positive for the blood test, then you rule out a myocardial infarction. If the cardiac uh, markers are negative, then think of an unstable angina, okay? So again, unstable sitting down, having those chest pains and so on. And here we don't have an ST elevation. So that's how you uh, think of uh, people coming with chest pains and so on. Do they have angina or do they have uh, actually a, a myocardial infarction? So you look at the EKG, you're gonna end up having an ST elevation if you have an MI and you have, you have to have a positive cardiac markers also. So then you have an MI. And the MI, it could be either a STEMI MI or non-STEMI MI. A STEMI, that means ST elevation MI or non-ST elevation MI. Okay, so in this case, a Q wave usually is, a, is present and it's an MI. If there's no Q wave, 
uh, you know, you could still, uh, you know, have an MI. So it doesn't have to have always a Q wave. Usually a Q wave is significant for um, uh, an infarct that you had for a while, by the way. It's more significant of a, an infarct that's been there for a while. Uh, but you can have a heart attack right now and show no Q wave and still uh, rule out uh, MI. I mean, that means it's a brand new MI. Okay, so even though we don't have an ST elevation, but uh, the cardiac markers actually uh, help you diagnose if you have an MI or, or unstable angina. So trans, transmural, which is going all the way through, usually you have an ST elevation. Subendocardial, usually you don't have an uh, ST elevation, okay? because it's, uh, it's not going all the way through the, the, all the layers of the heart. So this is what we call an algorithm to uh, diagnosing an STEMI. Uh, we do look at the uh, different leads, okay? So this is a normal EKG lead here. Uh, again, I will cover some of the EKG here, but uh, if you want to be certified, uh, then you have to take that at EKG certification exam. And uh, when you do that, they really concentrate on this a lot and they teach you a lot more uh, arrhythmias than the ones I'm gonna cover with you here. If you don't take it, then at least you have the basics uh, that you need to take with you to the, to the, um, uh, to the NCLEX. So this is a normal strip. Usually you have 12 leads, uh, EKGs, and each lead, uh, you know, like from here to here is one lead, from here to here. So uh, lead one, two, three, four. I'm sorry, lead one, two, three. Then we have ABR, ABL, ABF. Then we have B1 all the way through V6. These are the 12 leads that you read an EKG with. So lead one, lead two, three, ABR, ABL, ABF, B1, B2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. These are the 12 leads. And usually the leads that you place on your chest to get an EKG reading, uh, they, uh, they read the electrical activity of, you, of your heart. If you remember the SA node, AB node, bundle fist, all these, that electrical activity give you what we call a rhythm, heart rhythm. And uh, when we put the electrodes on you uh, into the EKG, uh, we get a strip reading and we get all these leads on there where you can see them and they should have a normal pattern. So normal pattern of EKGs uh, will tell you that this is normal, and if you start seeing any abnormal pattern within those leads, then you know there's something wrong. So in order for you to know the abnormality, you have to know what's normal in each leads. And that's where you actually will cover um, you know, in details if you take that course, but for now, uh, how many of you have been exposed to an EKG strip before? I have. Okay. Once or twice. Okay, let's ask, let's ask how many people have not seen a normal EKG strip? And it's okay to say it, by the way. I, I'm not expecting everybody that, you know, to have experience here. I know some, some people came from high school, my God. So, you know, you're not supposed to be seeing this. You know, Stephanie, have you, have you been exposed to this? I know you came from high school. I know Steph's not on. Um, oh. They had a mandatory English meeting to be at. Oh, Ooh. really? Yeah, so that's why a lot of people aren't on right now. Oh, okay. Well, it's recorded, so we'll post it. They can listen to that. Okay, well, some people are not. Uh, maybe doing tutoring with... Uh, with, uh, with any of the guys, you know, tutors, uh, they can explain that to you more. But if needed, you know, if you want me to go over it myself, I can do that. But I think Megan and Abby are pretty good at, you know, looking at, I think they, they've taken the EKG class also. But anyways, okay, so these are the different um, leads. So here's how we uh, go ahead and diagnose uh, uh, MIs using an EKG and the leads. Uh, we look at the leads uh, and then, uh, do we have an ST elevation at least in one, one or two, at least one to two millimeters in two anatomical um, 
uh, orient, uh, oriented leads. So that means, do I have an ST elevation that is one to two millimeters? Now you see those little boxes here? Each little box is one millimeter. So if I have uh, a, an elevation that goes up more than two small boxes, then it's an ST elevation, it's, it's a STEMI. So this one is a STEMI here because I have it more than teeny bitty, you know, because this, this large box consists of five small boxes here. Each little box is one millimeter. So here I have like maybe four or, you know, three millimeters at least. So here it says, if you have an ST elevation in more than two anatomical uh, oriented leads, okay, then it could be uh, an MI. Two leads in the same region. So you have to have two leads in the same region. So how do we tell if this is the same region or not? Uh, this, these are the regions right there. So lead one, okay, which is here, usually it's on the lateral side. It shows you the lateral side of the heart, which is this one here. The inferior is usually two, three, and AVF. So these here will show you an inferior type of MI. Uh, this one and this one will show uh, a uh, lateral, but it's not even here. But anyways, the anterior would be right over here. So these leads here. So that would, that would include, uh, you know, V1, um, you know, and septal also, both of them, septal or, uh, or anterior, it depends on the thing. So in the corner uh, will be lateral. So these are lateral here, these are lateral, this is anterior, uh, this is anterior, this is inferior, these are inferior here, okay? So it says anterior, then it's anterior, that means you have the blockage there. V1 and two are septal specifically, and then uh, V5 and six are lateral. Lateral on the right side, by the way, this is lateral on the left side, because left side of the heart is over here on, on this side, and this is the right side of the heart here. So by looking at this, you can tell where is your MI by looking at those ST elevations, okay? So uh, is the QRS complex of normal size? Well, if the QRS complex is widened, then you know that it's taken a while for the electricity to go through the ventricles. So that means that there's possibly an infarct somewhere because it's, there's a blockage that's not allowing this electricity to go through. So uh, with STEMIs, with STEMIs, if you have a STEMI, then it's very, very uh, narrow. So because you, you know, it's blocked, you know, the pathway is not going through, you stop right there. When you stop, then that means it's a STEMI because it's necrotic and, and the electri electrical activity is not going through the necrosis there. So usually the QRS is very, very thin. Q wave, negative. So negative, it means below. Uh, below the baseline. So if I look at this, this is your baseline, you guys. Straightforward here, straight line. If I put a straight line here, that's your baseline in EKG. Below the baseline is negative, above the baseline is positive. So QRS must be narrow in a STEMI. Q wave negative, which is, I told you that you have a prominent Q wave shooting down from a basement, from a baseline. Uh, in lead V1 and V2, so lead one, and uh, lead one, uh, I'm sorry, V1 and V2, V1 and V2, right there in these, uh, you have a Q wave plus R wave, the R wave is positive in lead six and lead five and six. So lead five and six, you're gonna have a positive R wave and then you're gonna have a V1 and V2, you're gonna have a negative uh, Q wave prominent there, then you could have an MI there. Okay. If yes, you can use this to diagnose a STEMI. If no, the, QR, the QRS is wide, then it could be hypertrophy. So why is uh, enlarged QRS is hypertrophy? Because there's a more space uh, for, it, for the electricity to go through because it's enlarged and then the QRS is widened. So you need to uh, be careful if it's uh, a hypertrophy or you're thinking of a STEMI in this case. If it's a Q, if the QRS is wide, you know there's uh, more uh, muscle to cover, so uh, it is more of a hypertrophy than a um, an MI. An MI, you have a cut, you know, a Q wave cut, 
very very narrow QRSs, very narrow QRS. Then is the QRS complex normal width? Well, again, we said that. If it's less than 0.12 seconds, uh, QRS must be within 0.12 uh, seconds, right? Uh, on the EKG, and if it's, uh, uh, if it's uh, uh, less than that, then there could be a bundled branch block, a right bundle branch, left or right bundle branch block. Uh, bundle branch block is basically, you have a, a necrotic tissue closer to the uh, Purkin G fibers or the bundle of his coming down into the ventricles. So if you have a necrosis right around here, then you have a block in the pathway of those bundles. So you call that left or right bundle branch block, depending if you're going to the left ventricle or the right ventricle. So either it's in the left Purkin G fibers or the right Purkin G fibers. That's what you're um, seeing here. So ST segment depression uh, presents in at least one lead. So if you have depression more than one lead, it, it's possible that you have an MI also. So there are different types of things that we look at in order to come and say this could be an MI, not only one thing. So all these are the algorithm that we look for in order to diagnose somebody with a STEMI. All right, so what is this an ischemia or is this an infarction? That's how you know we look at things. Again, the ST segment is often affected by ischemia and infarction. ST depression is more for ischemia. ST elevation frequently means infarction, but it could be ST depression if it's in multiple, more than one lead, that could be also infarction. So, but if uh, only one lead or two leads or so on, then it's more ischemia than uh, uh, MR. And here are some of the things that you can see. This is normal. Now, uh, ischemic area here, you're gonna end up having a little depression and, uh, you know, of the T wave and you have an inversion, a T wave right there. The T wave is inverted in this case. So you have it depressed, it's coming down. So you end up having a Q wave if you have an infarction there. Um, the, um, so Q wave again here, uh, and uh, infarct that is heal, a scar also Q wave will be presented on the EKG. So you could have minor elevation. It doesn't have to be huge elevations also to diagnose this. But usually you want it more than 0 .2, 0 .2, 0 0.2 milliliters. So reciprocal changes of the ST elevation. Again, uh, ST elevation in, in a couple of inequivalent needs. So, you need it, like we said, you have to have it elevated in different uh, leads to come. Uh, so, so if you have a depression, okay, rather than elevation, then uh, you would think of it as, uh, you know, it's a depression, it's not elevation. So don't confuse ST depression with ST uh, elevation here. I think that's what they're trying to say here. So you have usually uh, a delayed repolarization uh, because of the um, infarct. All right, what are some of the things that we do uh, to treat uh, MIs? So, um, Morphine, I don't know, are you asking like what we do when they come in or? Yeah, yeah. Morphine for yeah, I mean, Good job, yes, yes. So you do have all this here that we discussed, I guess, in, in pharmacology, we covered that. You know, we talked about the beta blockers and nitrate and ACE inhibitors and all that stuff that you can help with MIs. And um, uh, so we should always, uh, you know, aspirin, aspirin is the trick, you guys. Aspirin is, is uh, everyone, sh you know, at, at risk should be on one aspirin uh, every day. 81 milligrams, of course, the baby aspirin, we call that, uh, the coated aspirin, okay, uh, ecotrin, we call that ecotrin, or baby aspirin coated, okay. Uh, why do you want to give the coated aspirin to these patients? Is it for like extended release? 
Um, is that the reason we give you coded aspirin or because aspirin causes something else that we don't want? Is it to protect your stomach? Uh, to the stomach specifically. But it was to protect, I thought it was to protect the stomach lining or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, even though you were broken and big enough. Um, so I, <laughs> probably. But I understood what you said there. Absolutely. So the lining of the stomach, uh, because uh, aspirin is an acid, you guys. So aspirin is an acid. If we give you more acid on the stomach and multi continuous acid on the stomach, what's going to happen to the lining? You're going to uh, start getting ulcers. So we don't want this aspirin can cause uh, bleeding, you know, in, in, in the stomach. So we give you a coating type of aspirin so it you know, bypasses the stomach into the intestine and that's where it gets absorbed basically. So we don't want it to be absorbed in the stomach. We want it to be absorbed in the intestine, in the jejunum specifically. So rapid effect, which reduces mortality by 20%. So if you put those patients on aspirin, and if you suspect someone that is at risk of getting a heart attack and you put them on uh, aspirin a day, 81 milligrams, that will reduce their risk of getting MI with about, for about 20%. So uh, it, is, it is good to take it. Now, you don't want to go further than uh, 250 uh, or 300 max, okay, because then, you know, you, you, it, it, then, uh, you, it, it's going to cause, uh, you know, irritation in the stomach. So uh, this is the algorithm right there, pre-hospital or on arrival. Uh, you're gonna put these patients on uh, 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 nitroglycerin, right? Uh, spray or oxygen, pain, pain relief, uh, you know, admission to the hospital, aspirin thrombolytic also. Uh, during the hospital, you put them on beta blockers and their uh, insulin. Okay, why do we put them on insulin again? Anybody would remember? What does insulin do? What's the function of insulin? To allow glucose into the cell. Yeah. So it reduces, um, it, is that Stephanie? <laughs> she just came in. <laughs> oh, wow. I, meant, I mentioned your name just maybe five minutes ago. And, oh. uh, you know, Kylie said she's not here. She's at an English meeting. Yeah, we just then, ended. Oh, let me ask you this question then. Have you had... Do you, uh, you came from high school, right, uh, Stephanie? Yeah. Or you yeah. went to college before you came from high school? High school. So you, you've never been exposed to an EKG strip before, right? No. Okay. All right. So some of you are like that. And I need, I need to make sure that you understand an EKG strip. Okay. So, you know, like yeah. the cycle and, uh, and, and what is it? Uh, so talk to Abby and, and, uh, and Megan uh, to teach you this a little bit more. If you need me, just let me know and I can, we can do a one-on-one, -on -one. but I, I think they're competent enough to help you out. Okay, so they'll okay. go over that a little bit more uh, with you. Okay. All right, Thank so um, yeah, you and the other guys that, that uh, never been exposed. So I'm expecting a bunch actually. Uh, all right, so we, uh, during hospital, we, have, we put them on beta blocker, insulin to reduce the amount of glucose. So when we reduce the amount of glucose in your cell, okay, we are not causing it uh, to, do, to be um, in a way, uh, you know, uh, because as soon as you uh, reduce the amount of glucose, uh, the cell can, uh, believe it or not, relaxes from having a lot of ATPs being generated, even though we want it to, right? But the thing is, because of the myocardial infarction, we want to lessen the effect of ATPs in those cells to make it uh, feel comfortable. So that's why insulin is a good, uh, uh, good uh, drug to come along with, with, uh, with this um, beta blocker and ACE inhibitor. Uh, so yep. consider, yes, questions? I was just going to ask, so basically the insulin kind of almost acts as a de-stressor for the heart during those episodes, so that way it can relax? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the whole idea is, uh, because when you have a myocardial infarction, you know, if, if we give you insulin, then it, uh, it does not 
send a lot of glucose in there. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it controls the blood sugar, right? So you don't hyperactive the muscle cell. That's where we're going with this. So we don't want it to be very hyperactive and then it will usually uh, uh, be treated better uh, with, the, with the cell. Thank you. I'll be in calm rather than very active due to the amount of sugar that goes in there. Alrighty. So considering uh, uh, revascularization, okay, and revascularization that means producing more oxygen, reaching you know uh, the the the, uh, the tissue, we can do that through an angioplasty uh, we just mentioned, which is putting uh, basically a stent, which is stenting, which is the next word there, or an arterial bypass. We know that we can do an arterial bypass, open heart bypass. Uh, for people that uh, have more than one blockage. So usually uh, three blockages and up, uh, it, it requires an open heart. So uh, long-term, uh, you need to put them on aspirin, beta blocker, ACE inhibitors, and statins also. All right, so let's go into some of the nursing assessment where you guys have to come in. Uh, patients usually appear restless and in distress when they come uh, having all those, those chest pains, uh, the skin is warm, a uh, warm and moist, uh, labored and rapid breathing. Usually, you hear crackles. Okay, ronchi. Uh, what is a crackle sound? Anybody can tell me or ronchi. Have you had uh, physical uh, PNE already, uh, or you haven't? In foundation, they did right. Didn't they teach you how to the basic examination, or not yet? Not yet, but basically it's kind of like a, um, it's like a broken wind sound. Like it's kind of like you're blowing through like, um, like broken material and it just kind of has like, it sounds obstructed when, when, when you're breathing. You can kind of hear resistance when you breathe. It's kind of like a whistle being blocked or something. Yep. 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 Very good. Yeah. Uh, here, I'll tell you what. Yes. Anybody else? Crackles sound like um, if you like put your hair in between your fingers Good and like job. move it. Yeah, that's Stephanie. Pay a lot of attention, don't you? No, that's okay. Kinga. Oh, Kinga. Uh, okay, Kinga. Okay, Kinga. Yes. So you guys, you know, take take your fingers and put that on your hair, and rub your hair next to your ear. You know, you can hear like little crackle sound kind of. So it, it, this is what you actually uh, you know would be hearing. You know, how about Rankai? Anybody heard the Rankai? What a Rankai would, would uh, hear? Kind of like a rattling sound. Kind of like. Yes, yes, you're right. Uh, it's usually... Isn't it also low pitch too? Like a very low pitched kind of sound? Uh, Rankai? Um, yes. Yeah, it is. It, it's like a rumble, uh, low pitch. You know, it's not a high pitch, but it's uh, low. But it's it's like a, a rumbling. You know, that's that's how you think of it. Usually, it's due to uh, probably uh, you know sometimes when you don't breathe well, what's going to happen to you? You're going to have all the mucus sitting inside your airways, so you're going to hear that because of the mucus uh, staying inside your airways rather than coming out. All right, good. Uh, so increase. Blood pressure related to anxiety or a decreased blood pressure caused by heart failure. So you need to be careful with these people. You know, when you do their blood pressure, uh, sometimes it's increased, you know, because they're anxious uh, or decreased because of the heart failure that they could have also. So if you remember, you know, with the MI, you can, uh, that can lead to heart failure also. Because when you have necrosis of the uh, myocardium, eventually you're going to end up having uh, the heart to fail. So heart rate may uh, vary from bradycardia to tachycardia. Again, arrhythmias, different arrhythmias. An auscultation, the first heart sound may be diminished as a result of decreased contractility. So the first heart sound uh, represents what? The first heart sound would be like the systolic pressure. Isn't it the opening of the valves? Is it opening or closing of the valves? Closing of the valves. Closing. Closing, closing of the AV valves? So it sounds, it gives you, 
Closure of the AV valves, absolutely. And what are the two AV valves that we know? Mitral and tricuspid. Absolutely. So the closure of the mitral and the tricuspid gives you the first heart sound. What is the second heart sound giving you? The opening. The pulmonary uh, semilinear valve and the systemic so semilunar semi valve. Semilunar, yes. The closure of the semilunar valves, which are what? What are the two semilunar valves? Pulmonary. Systemic and, and pulmonary. Pulmonary aortic. and? Aortic. Systemic. Aortic. Pulmonary and aortic. So pulmonary and aortic are the closure of these two valves, which are referred to as semilunar valves, uh, would give you the second heart sound. Okay. Now, you could have other heart sounds in between, all right? And that is usually uh, like if you have one of the valves closing a little bit later than the other. And usually they do. Normally, believe it or not, they do, but it's not significant enough to hear them. But if they do close significantly and you can hear them, then you're gonna end up having S3 and S4. You see what I'm saying with this? So the closure, both valves, either the semilunar or the AV valves, they close at the same time simultaneously, but with a partial time difference, just a little bit. If they are significant, that is a sign of some kind of heart issue, like in, in the MI. So here, I'm gonna hear a fourth heart sound, okay, in those MI, so that means the semilunar valves, uh, one of them will close a little bit uh, earlier than the other, and you can hear that. Okay, because that's where we're ejecting uh, the blood, and uh, when we have a little closure, one before the other, what does that mean? That means maybe the left ventricle is affected, and it's not sending the blood uh, uh, as fast as the right ventricle, and then you have this issue of having that fourth heart sound. Transient systolic murmurs, okay? Uh, so again, uh, systolic murmurs, you know, when you eject, right? The semilunar valves, the closure uh, happen at the end of systolic, you know? So uh, if you have a transient, like a change in that, in those, uh, you know, a murmur, those, uh, so what is a murmur, by the way? An abnormal what? Heart sound. Due to what? Improper valve closing. Good job. So I don't want you to confuse murmurs with arrhythmias, right? So when we talk arrhythmias, what are we dealing with? With Not the right heartbeat. Exactly. So the beats, the beats comes from what? From the electrical activity, right? The beats from the contraction. So you hear the contraction and that is basically your beats. And the beats have to do with the electricity. Murmurs has to do with the valves. So don't confuse contractions of the muscles with the murmurs of the valves. So after about 48 to 72 hours, many patients acquire a pericardial friction rub, okay? So that could be, uh, you know, when you have a friction rub, uh, anyone have an idea what is a pericardial friction rub? What does that mean? Uh, the that was the pericardium rubbing, the rubbing on the wall. What is rubbing on what? Pericardium. Rubbing on what? Is it on the uh, thir in like against the wall of the thoracic cavity? Because it's so enlarged. Okay, how many layers of pericardium do we have? Three. Okay, mainly two, right? So we have the parietal pericardium and we have the visceral, right? So what do we have inside the space of the pericardial space? What do we have in there normally? We have a little fluid, just a teeny bit of fluid that keeps it moist. What's that? Yeah, so we have a little fluid there. So if this fluid dries up, then we're going to end up having what we call pericardial friction. Because the pericardium layers will start friction, uh, 
uh, they'll have a friction, you know, among them rubbing against each other because of the loss of the fluid. So sometimes you get that with MI patients. All right, so patients with right ventricle infarcts, right ventricle, not the left, may present with jugular vein distension. Does that make sense? And why? And why? How do you explain that? So when the, when the right ventricle fails, okay, so let's say you have an MI on the right ventricle. Now we know the right ventricle sends blood to what? What blood vessel? What's the major blood vessel that the right ventricle sends blood to? You guys know that one. Stephanie, you know that one. You, you, said, you said, where does it go from the right ventricle? Yeah, from the right ventricle, it goes to what large blood vessel? To the, to the, pulmon to the oh, yeah. pulmonary stimulator valve. Pulmonary. Or, or sorry, the trunk, right? The pulmonary trunk. Yeah. So if the pulmonary trunk. So if you, if you, if the right ventricle fails to pump because of the scar that you have on the right ventricle, What's going to happen to the blood? You're not going to send the. You're not going to pump the blood into the much blood into the uh, pulmonary trunk, and the blood will back flow backwards into the right atrium, and then back into the superior vena cava, which takes you up to the jugular vein, and then down uh, the. It, you'll have a back flow into the inferior vena cava, which goes through the liver and then into your vascular, venous vascular uh, supply in your legs and eventually having edema because of that and, and elevated central venous pressure also. So the venous pressure will elevate automatically because of the backflow of the blood. Does that make sense, you guys? All right, so let's move on. All right, so now we're gonna get into the endocardial and valvular diseases. So we have uh, uh, problems with the uh, valves, uh, and we can have problems with the endocardium. So the endocardium is the most inner layer out of the three layers of the heart, the muscles. So we have endocardium, myocardium, and epicardium, uh, which is the visceral pericardium. Uh, so uh, endocardial and valvular structures may be damaged by inflammation and scarring, uh, calcification, and congenital malformation. So all these can predispose to uh, valvular problems and endocardial problems. So let's look at the valvular. We can have either a stenosis of the valve or we can have what we call regurgitation or insufficiency of a valve, okay? So what is a stenosis of a valve? That means the valve has issues trying to open completely. So when, when, it wants to, when the left ventricle wants to eject blood into the aorta, if you have aortic stenosis, that valve does not open completely, so you're gonna have less blood shooting up into the aorta. So that is referred to as stenosis. Now regurgitation is the problem where the valve leaflets or doors do not close properly after the ejection happens. So you're gonna have leakage of blood back, back flowing into the chamber before that. So let's say that you have aortic regurgitation. That means the aortic valves do not close properly. So you're gonna have some of the blood after systolic, some of the blood from the aorta will flow back into the left ventricle. So now the amount of left ventricle filling and filling is gonna increase because of all that backflow blood going into the left ventricle. So those, uh, so you can have mitral valve uh, prolapse, you can have mitral valve um, uh, stenosis also. So think what would happen if you have stenosis? You're gonna have backflow. You're gonna have backflow with regurgitation also. So you're not gonna pump all the blood out from that chamber. You're gonna keep some left in that chamber and that's the issue there. Now, murmurs are common with valvular disorders. So that's one thing that we uh, always listen to, val to, to the valves. 
So how do, what, what are the different ways to listen to the, uh, to the valves uh, uh, sound? What is the most common way to listen to valves sounds or murmurs in general? With your stethoscope? Auscultation. Telescope, auscultation, right? So auscultation, stethoscope. Can we look at valves uh, closing and opening uh, through another test? Yes. What, yes. Is it? what is it called? Is it an electrocardiogram? No. Well, you could do the echocardiogram. An echo? Echo, echo, yes. An echo, it shows you the, uh, uh, the extent of the, vent of the, of the uh, muscle, muscles, how large they are or how thin they are, uh, the size of the muscles, and it shows you the valves closing and opening if they're functioning, functioning well or not. So an echocardiogram. Because echo sound, so you hear sounds, you hear, you hear murmurs through a microphone rather than, uh, you know, auscultation using, using a stethoscope. So here's your mitral stenosis. So let's say if I have stenosis in the mitral valve, so this picture right there shows you this is normal, and now I have stenosis here. So if I have stenosis, that means it doesn't open all the way. So now I'm trying to get the blood from the left atrium down into the left ventricle. How much blood is going to come in? Not too much. Where is that blood going to stay? Right here in the, in the uh, left atrium. Now, the left atrium is going to backflow back into what, 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 what's back here? What's back here coming out of the uh, pulmonary veins? Which the lungs. The lungs. So you're going to have congestion right there. See how it is? Everything kind of backflows. So with this, Blood flows from uh, right, uh, left atrium to left ventricle impaired during a, So increased pressure of the left, left atrium, which is right over here, leads to atrial chamber enlargement. Okay, so we're going to get enlargement here. And then can lead to chronic pulmonary hypertension. Right there, the lungs, chronic pulmonary hypertension, right ventricular hypertrophy. So where's the right uh, ventricular? Uh, where's the right uh, ventricle? Right here. So why... Why are you going to get hypertrophy here, okay? Because all that backflow right there. Now, because this is now is not going through here, right? I'm not going through here. So because the right ventricle, where does the blood go from right ventricle to what? To this one. What is this called? Your here. pulmonary trunk. Pulmonary trunk. So if I'm trying to go in here and I'm back and, and the lung is full of blood, what's going to happen to the blood? It's going to backflow here. What's going to happen to this chamber? It's going to get enlarged. Why? Because it's trying to pump all that blood and it can't. So it gets enlarged. Where's the blood going to backflow? Up here. So this one will get enlarged also. So right ventricular hypertrophy and right side heart failure. So this side of the heart will fail because I can't push the blood through the pulmonary trunk into this because everything is backflowing in the lung. So low pitch rumbling diastolic murmur. Okay, low pitch, that means it's very low to hear. Um, uh, and uh, rumbling diastolic murmur. So we said diastolic, which, which valve is closing during diastolic? Um, a, a valve, a, a, B valves or semilunar valves during diastolic? Lunar valves? It, it's the AV valves here. So these guys here, okay, because during diastolic, what happened? These guys open. Blood goes down here, then they close. That's diastolic. Systolic, open this, open this. Blood goes this way, blood goes this way. Systolic. So now I'm going to hear a rumbling sound because this is not going through. So I'm rumbling right over here. So you're going to rumble when diastolic, diastolic rumbling, open snap. So what is the open snap? It's going to go like, you know, open snap. This snap. Uh, you're going to hear it because the valve opens a little bit and it snaps closed after that. So you can have atrial dysrhythmia because the atrium kind of failing right here. And uh, atrial clots. So you can have, you can have clots because of the, all that blood uh, staying in the atria here. Uh, exertional dyspnea. So on, uh, when you do an exercise, you're going to end up having Heart, uh, heart breathing. So regurgitation, just think of the uh, mechanism that I told you and it's simple. You know, so if I have regurgitation here, that means what again? What did we say regurgitation is? 
Uh, and then they, they can't completely close. Yeah. So it doesn't uh, completely close. It stays partially open, and some of the blood will flow back this way. So now I have more blood back flowing here because the blood should go down here this way. But because it rumbles, it just uh, keeps some blood to flow back this way because the pressure here becomes higher. So as the systolic comes in, some of the blood will shoot back up here. So now I have more blood in here. So back flow of blood from the left ventricle, which is over here, to the left atrium, which is over here, during systole. Why? Because during systolic, this left ventricle, it's going to shoot up blood up here, and guess what? It shoots it up here also. So left atrium and, and ventricle dilate. So I have this guy, uh, left atrium uh, and ventricle dilate, and hypertrophy causes extra volume. So specifically, I would say more of this one dilating, and then you have extra volume sitting in here. Uh, may lead to left side uh, heart failure, which is right over here, and then high pitch uh, pansystolic. So now... You have a pansystolic rather than diastolic as the, mito as the uh, uh, stenosis, the mitral valve. Why, why pansystolic? Pan it means all across the systolic. Because as I push the blood up here, now this valve here, which is the aortic valve, will open up and close, uh, uh, will open up during systolic. And this one, this blood will go through the same time as this blood going into the aorta. So I'm going to hear a murmur for this blood going in there and this valve trying to uh, close. Uh, and that is referred to as pansystolic, blowing murmur. You're going to hear a blowing murmur because the blood is going to be shooting up this way during the systolic phase of this blood going into the aorta. Giant V wave, okay? Um, you know, uh, basically, uh, it, it, it feels like a ventricular, you know, like a V, uh, like a, uh, a giant wave going through uh, the, the, the sound, the heart of, of the, the sound that we hear here. Uh, chronic weakness and fatigue. All right, so if we do mitral valve... Uh, Dr. J, I have, yes. a, I, have a, I have a question. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, so when, when you were describing pansystolic, I was under the impression that it... It's kind of sim it's kind of like a similar um, process as if it's gonna be um, or uh, okay I'm sorry hang on I'm under the impression that pansystolic means that the valves are are involved in systole and diastole at the same time from what you're describing is that is that kind of an accurate way uh, of thinking, no. or am I thinking wrong no pansystolic pan it means across systolic and right. diastolic so keep it this way because otherwise you'll you'll involve diastolic with it you know so pan okay. systolic across the systolic phase that's what it means so you're going to hear uh, that okay yeah you're going to hear that sound during the systolic phase which is the ventricle pumping blood into the aorta that's how you think oh uh, okay okay so it's just an abnormal sound during systole right absolutely okay okay all right that makes sense thank you absolutely. good job yes that's exactly what it is you're welcome okay all right, so now we're prolapsing. Now, what's the difference between a prolapse and a regurgitation? So, uh, so uh, usually- Does prolapse you know, mean collapsed? Say again? Doesn't prolapse mean collapsed? Yeah, yeah. Prolapsed, it means it is very loose where it's very hard to even close, you know? Uh, regurgitation, it means it's a, it's a little bit weak a valve where uh, it doesn't close properly, but prolapsing is a weak uh, valve where uh, also uh, blood can go back, but it's not as serious as regurgitation. Prolapse is, you know, many of us have mitral valve prolapse, which it prolapses a little bit backwards, okay? So you see how uh, here I'm trying to, uh, to get the blood going into the aorta. And then at the same time, this pressure pushes the valve backwards this way where it allows some of the blood to go back. So this is a weak valve uh, that is pushed back. You see, it is just pushed back. It's closed, 
but it's pushed back, but it, it allows a little blood to seep in between it uh, up this, this way. Uh, but this guy, uh, regurgitation, look at this. You know, it's, it's like open almost, right? So it, it doesn't close well. So it's open. So you, 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 find, you find blood, uh, more blood actually going through than just a prolapse. So prolapsing is like prolapsing backwards into the ventricle. That's, that's uh, into the atrium. That's what we're thinking here. So, uh, so we have uh, ballooning of the mitra. So it becomes like a balloon. You see that? So it looks like a balloon here. Uh, leaflet into the left atrium during ventricular systolic. So during systolic, it balloons backwards. Uh, woman affected more than men, typically asymptomatic. Many people don't even have any symptoms with this. Uh, mid systolic click. Okay. So now uh, we we what what happens is after the systole, the systole. You know, you're gonna have a murmur. Okay. It's called systolic murmur because it is, but you also have uh, uh, it being called as mid-systolic click. Uh, why? Because it happens during the middle time of the systolic uh, phase. So mid-systolic click, you can have a click uh, midway during the systolic uh, phase when the blood is trying to rush into the aorta here. So palpitation, right? So uh, now what is palpitation again? Flutters, like atrial flutters. It's where the patient can actually feel the atrial flutter. Look, don't don't uh, confuse it. Yes, the what the palpitation. Yes. Yeah, where they now, can actually feel it or see it. Yeah. Now atrial flutter is an arrhythmia. Uh, not sure who answered this one, but atrial flutter is an arrhythmia. That's something else. Okay, you you diagnose that on EKGs usually. Palpitation is when the heart kind of beats fast enough and strong enough where you can actually see the shirt moving. So if you look at your chest and you feel like your heart is, you know, like bounding, right? And you see the shirt, you know, actually moving, that is what we call palpitation. So you can have palpitation, you can have rhythm abnormalities and that, that has to do with electricity, uh, dizziness, fatigue, dyspnea, chest pain, depression, and anxiety. So some, most of the people are asymptomatic. They have no feeling whatsoever about this. But if you do, then you can have a little palpitation. Uh, sometimes uh, arrhythmia, uh, dizziness, fatigue. Uh, many, most of the people, they, they, they complain of fatigue, tiredness. Uh, they come to you and they say, I feel tired. I, I feel you know, uh, tired and anxious. Sometimes they tell they tell you tired and anxious. Uh, with that, you would think that uh, they're actually um, uh, then you they're diagnosed with this. You know. All right. So uh, stenosis and narrowing so of the aorta. So uh, the blood is shooting up the aorta. If it's stenosis, that means it's uh, it's not open uh, uh, well. So less blood is going to shoot up right? When you have less blood shooting up, many of the blood will be left over here. It's going to backflow here. It's going to backflow into the lung again. Same principle. So predominant cause is age-related calcium deposits. I want you to underline this because this is very important. You know, we take x-rays of uh, uh, older people and then we find calcium deposits uh, close to their heart there, okay? Or you can do a CAT scan on them and do that. So calcium deposits closer to aorta, the aortic valve is a significant sign of possibly aortic stenosis. Uh, so, uh, so you have calcium deposits close to the aorta, aortic uh, valve, which leads to, to uh, steno, steno, stenotic valves. Older people get that. Calcification of valve will lead to aortic stenosis and you're not gonna be able to send enough blood out and then they need a valve replacement for that. So some older people go through valve replacement because of the calcification that they get uh, of that aortic valve. And it's very important to have the aortic valve pump, uh, you know, open because all the blood goes into the body through the uh, aortic valve. So uh, results in obstruction of aortic fl outflow from the left ventricle into the aorta during systolic 
or systole, left ventricular hypertrophy. Well, of course, this, this uh, here is going to be hypertrophied because of the extra work that it does uh, when all the blood is back flowing down here. It may result in ischemia. Well, you know, you send a little bit less blood out here. What's going to happen to the tissue afterwards? Ischemia and left-sided heart failure. So this is going to fail after a while because it's not, uh, you know, all the force uh, increasing in the in the you know load uh, the heart load in here. Uh, crescendo di crescendo murmur. Crescendo di crescendo murmur during ventricular systole with prominent S4 syncope uh, with prominent S4. Uh, so. The shando, the crescendo, okay? This is, means the murmur that you hear up and down, up and down, up and down. So you hear there, loud, uh, uh, faint, loud, faint, loud, faint. So you hear loud and a faint sound of that murmur. This is typical of aortic stenosis during systole. So, and a prominent S4, again, we said S4 is uh, delayed in the closure of the semilunar valves, and in this case, the aortic valve. So you're going to end up having a prominent S4 because this one, this one is going to close uh, normally, but this one is not going to close normally because of all the issues it has. So you have a delayed closure in this guy, then this guy, and then you have this problem. Uh, some people go into syncope. Why would you go into syncope? Would it be lack of oxygen? Yeah, because we're not going to have enough uh, blood being pumped out into the brain, specifically through here, and then you're going to pass out because of that. How about fatigue? Again, not enough oxygen. Angina, chest pain because of that. You can dig at that. So aortic regurgitation. Here we go. Again, principles are similar because we, uh, we, we don't, in this case, this valve does not close well, so you're going to have blood back flowing into this ventricle and not enough blood shooting up. So incompetent aortic valve allow blood to leak back into the, uh, from the aorta back into the left ventricle over here during diastole because, you know, systole you push up, diastole comes in, this should relax, and then many of the blood back flowing into here during diastole. Causes of normal aortic valve and aortic uh, root dilatation, okay? So uh, abnormal uh, valve here uh, lead to left ventricle hypertrophy because you have more more blood here uh, with eventual left side heart failure. So this side will fail. High pitch blowing murmur, okay? Because you're going like into here, you're gonna hear like uh, systole will go like, <laughs> okay? You can hear that because some of the blood will come and back here and then it'll close. So you're gonna hear that uh, you know, uh, uh, during diastole, right? And high pitch uh, uh, systolic, high systolic blood pressure, of course, uh, can, and, uh, high systolic uh, pressure, diastolic pressure usually low. Um, so, um, so high systolic blood pressure, Okay, who wants to explain that to me? Why would you have high blood pressure where we don't have enough blood going out there? Okay, so what do you think is, um, is happening here? Is that a like a feedback mechanism to increase the blood pressure. So if I don't have enough blood going in there, what's going to happen to your blood vessels? They're going to vasoconstrict. See that? Because you're not going to have enough blood coming out. So, and vasoconstriction can lead to, uh, to um, systolic blood pressure. Why? Because now you're blowing the blood into narrowed blood vessels. So a feedback is vasoconstriction and that would lead to high blood pressure later on in time. Uh, so diastolic pressure also uh, usually low because you don't have enough blood in here and then you have palpitation there. What about the endocardium? The endocardium, you know, you have issues 
with, um, with uh, the endocardium, usually streptococcus A uh, or B, uh, hemolytic streptococcus infection. So uh, you get strep infections all the time. So you, your, your throat, you can get strep throat, and then you, uh, when you get the strep throat, then it, it, can, lead, it can go and sp spread into your joints, the heart, the skin, you know, nervous system, and all that. So if it does that, it hits your heart. And hitting your heart, it hits the endocardium usually. And you're going to end up having what we call uh, rheumatic heart disease. So uh, rheumatic heart disease is uh, when you have uh, a previous uh, uh, group A beta hemolytic streptococcus infection that usually um, attacks your throat and it spreads into the other parts of your body because of that. So a good case would be a patient came in that was previously diagnosed with strep throat and then led to this and that and so on. So you have to have like a previous uh, strep throat type of uh, uh, type of uh, condition in order, in order for them to uh, end up having the other situations there. Now it occurs more frequent in children uh, because they get more of the strep throat than anything. In order to have rheumatic heart disease, you have to have more than one issue. So you can't say, uh, oh, I have rheumatic heart disease, I have a strep throat. It's not enough. You have a strep throat, and then after the strep throat, you end up having other issues, specifically endocarditis. If you end up having that, then you know that you are being diagnosed with rheumatic heart disease. So you have fever, sore throat, joint inflammation, involuntary movement, uh, Sydenham, uh, Korea. Uh, you know, uh, Sydenham or Sydenham depends on uh, who's pronouncing it. Uh, this is what is Korea? Don't tell me the uh, you know, the country here. But what is uh, what is Korea here? In medical, when do you get Korea? What kind of symptoms you get if you get Korea? Huntington, Korea. Remember we covered that once before? What does Huntington disease give you? Um, involuntary muscle movement or yeah, weakness of the muscle? Continue. Like, like it'd be an irregular, because irregular movement to the muscles kind of. Yeah. Yeah, so you get that type of uh, issues when you have uh, this type of uh, uh, rheumatic heart disease. <clears throat> right, so here are some valves here involved. Uh, we do sometimes we replace the valves because of this, because they, they, you know, rheumatic heart disease can lead to valve replacement for sure. And this is some of the ways where they uh, bring in the synthetic uh, uh, valve and they put it back in here that opens and closes. It's made out of uh, you know, it looks like uh, rubber here, uh, but it's synthetic. It's made out of, uh, uh, not sure what the material is, but it's, um, it's um, a material that is acceptable by the body and they don't reject it. So, uh, so rheumatic heart disease, what did we say again? Previous, previous type of infection in the mouth or so. Now, if I say infective endocarditis, uh, this is when your heart is infected somehow. Okay, now you could uh, start with pericarditis and then eventually it goes inside. Uh, strep and staph is infecting your heart somehow. Now, uh, sometimes, um, you know, uh, invasion and colonization of endocardial structures by microorganisms is resulting in inflammation of vegetation. So you end up having what we call vegetation here. So the vegetation, um, is, is the term that we use when you have infection and then healing from the infection. Uh, well, not healing yet, but uh, the bacteria is attacking uh, the, the tissue. It's still in the process of attacking. Uh, most common bacteria, streptococcus and staphylococcus in this case. We have acute and we have subacute. 
If it's acute infective endocarditis, the, it's very, very prognosis poor. Okay, uh, intravenous drug users can uh, uh, give you this. So if you use, uh, uh, um, you know, infected uh, needles, then that bacteria can go all the way to your heart and cause this. Um, Subacute infective uh, endocarditis, predisposing risk factors, typically present. So you, you have to have a predisposing factor there. So needles, uh, needles, intravenous drug users, they more uh, get what we call the acute infective. Uh, Subacute, that means what? Predisposing risk factor, that means you've been infected somewhere else and it got to your heart. For example, if you had a kidney uh, issue, infection in the kidney, and eventually gets to your heart. So that means that's a secondary type of infection. So subacute would be uh, due to a secondary uh, type of infection that you have. So myocardial uh, disease, we have myocarditis, which is inflammation of the myocardium right here. Uh, this is, uh, uh, some people misdiagnose these things. You know, it's very hard to diagnose the myocarditis because, um, you know, it's inflammation of the heart muscle. Uh, sometimes it's become necrotic, okay? And then you have degeneration of the myocytes in here. Okay, some of these myocytes become degenerative. Uh, inflammations can lead to that. So you have an inflammation of uh, the heart uh, muscles. Uh, usually the clinical course would be acute and stormy. So people can collapse on the court, you know, some uh, sports, uh, sports uh, figure uh, goes through this uh, myocarditis and recovery or death. So some of them, they collapse and die right there, die right there, or they come out of it and they can end up having what we call cardiac failure uh, occurring within months after that onset. So uh, myo, myo, uh, myocardial disease, uh, you can have cardiomyopathy, which is basically a genetic, could be genetic, it could be acquired, okay, and uh, it's just enlargement of the fibers of the muscles here. Uh, it, it involves more insidious, insid, insid, insidiously over years uh, with a few symptoms under the heart uh, slips uh, into failure, until the heart slips into failure. All right, I guess I'm slipping with my words here, so let me just finish this slide. Uh, uh, and then let me see what's coming up here. Yeah, I'll, I'll wait, I'll cover. All right, let's just do this slide here, myocarditis. Again, uh, you have myocardial disease, you could have a cardiomyopathy, right? Or you could have necrosis of the muscles here, which is my, uh, you know, we, we call it myocarditis, right? So myocarditis, which is here, uh, cardiomyopathy, enlargement of the heart. Uh, we don't know why, but it can lead to heart failure. Uh, usually those things uh, uh, are characterized by inflammation, leukocytes infiltration, necrosis of the myocardial uh, cells. Uh, microorganisms can lead to that. Immune mediated diseases can lead to that. Underline this, you know, many people come uh, with lupus or so, and then eventually having heart issues. So myocarditis could be due to that, you know, Graves disease could get to that also. Autoimmune or immune deficient uh, type of problems. Vital ideology, most viral ideology, viruses, underlying circle viruses. If you get myocarditis, very high chance that it's a virus that attacks you, not a bacteria. So myocarditis, think of it as viral. Endocarditis, think of it as bacterial. You guys got that one? Underline this, that's a question on the test. So which one is myocarditis? Viral. Which one, endocarditis? Bacterial. Good? All right, characterized by left ventricular dysfunction, flappy. You get the flappy type of, uh, uh, type of uh, sound that you get uh, there with patchy or diffuse necrotic lesion and general dilatation of all four chambers. All right, I'm gonna stop here. I'm running out of gas. So, uh, okay, so we will uh, cover, um, we will uh, cover 
uh, the rest of the chapter uh, soon uh, on Wednesday. When I see you on Wednesday, we'll cover the rest of it. So be ready uh, to go all the way with that. Uh, and uh, this exam is this weekend. So um, I asked Abby and uh, uh, Megan to cover Path of Fizz with you guys. I uh, supplied them with some material that they can use. Uh, but still, you guys do the uh, focus points as much as you can, and they will go over that with you. And if you want to go over uh, the same material with the other your tutors, you can do take your pick, whichever you like. So you can go over that uh, uh, focus points, uh, give them some material for you to run through, some questions and all that for them to uh, go over with you. So, uh, all right, until Wednesday, any questions, you guys? Anything else? Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Thank you, Dr. J. You're welcome. Oh, you. oh actually, Dr. J, I just had yes. a quick, quick question. Uh, will this be, um, will this PowerPoint be updated on Blackboard? Because I know this was a little out of order um, from a previous version, um, and it didn't uh, have uh, I, I did post it, okay, key. recently. I think okay. I did it yesterday. So the one that you have, yeah, okay. the one you probably you pulled it out earlier. But I did, uh, you know, as I make oh, okay. exams and so on, I have, I have update them so you'll find the information in the PowerPoint. You know, I match the exams accordingly. So I, so you should have the most updated one right there for you. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank All you. All right. Take care guys. We'll see Dr. you. J. Yeah. Yeah. Steph. Brittany. Steph. Did you upload the oh, Diana. new drug tester farm? Yes, I just did. So okay. I posted the one that we worked on today. And uh, on the Wednesday, I will, we will work on uh, three more charts, small charts, smaller than this one. Uh, and maybe I'll modify them then as I lecture and I'll post them. But, I, but they're all posted there as, a, you know, for you to start with if you want to start with them. Okay. okay thank you. All right, Diana. See you later. Hi, guys. See you uh, Wednesday.